In this podcast number nine, I'll be talking to Matt Oakley, the Head of Commercial Research at Savills. Matt's been analysing the UK property market for nearly 30 years. I've spoken to him a couple of times and I think it's fair to say he knows his onions and we're lucky to be listening to him today on an interesting topic. We're looking at commercial yields in the market in the past year leading up to Brexit and I'll be asking him to read the tea leaves moving forwards, even though I know he's not particularly happy about that. Matt, as always, great to see you and thanks for joining us today. My pleasure, Paul. Matt, I think it's fair to say that we're facing some difficult times with Brexit on the horizon, and we have been for the last couple of years. I know from my personal clients that it's impacting on the real estate market in a variety of ways. Matt, I've had a look at the Savills commercial sector analysis um, of April 2019, And from this analysis, which I know you had an input in, it breaks down each area of the commercial market from West End office space to food stores to industrial units to leisure parks to regional hotels and so on. It seems that over the last year, amongst all the uncertainty, there's been little significant change in one particular sector. You may disagree. Overall, though, there's been a slight increase in the yields for commercial with the average prime yields increasing to 4.81%. One of the statistics on the analysis is that high street retail has increased in yield, which is surprising to me. I find that bizarre because, as we're all aware, high street retail has been really dramatically affected recently. Can you explain to us why the yield has gone up? Yes, of course. And you're quite right in saying that you know UK retail has been having a torrid time in recent yeah. years. and. It, it probably has more to do with the swing towards omni-channel than it does with Brexit, but Brexit has played a part. And I think you know the, the explanation for the rise in yields is quite straightforward. You know, there are relatively few buyers for retail property in the UK market, um, so that gives them a, a, you know, a, an upper hand in negotiations, so they're, they're arguing to pay a lower price for the assets. However, the rental income on the sort of prime retail assets is relatively stable just because of the quirks of the UK lease. So essentially, you're paying less for the same income and therefore your yield has gone up. And I think we're just edging towards a moment when you know some clients may start to think, well, UK retail looks cheap. And we're definitely seeing the beginnings of an upswing in opportunistic investor interest in the best of the UK retail assets because while you know Omnichannel has hit UK retail I think most people accept the fact that we will continue to shop in shops we just don't need quite so many of them. So you just said then invest in the best of retail um, assets so if I uh, have a client, an investor, a high net worth, they're thinking about investing in retail. You said the best there. What area of the retail market are you particularly looking at? I think there are probably a number of simple rules of thumb. And the most simple is, you know, good retail is somewhere that people want to shop. So in a relatively modest catchment you know, away from the southeast, that may be quite an affordable scheme with a mix of value-orientated retailers because they're selling the type of goods that, that people in that catchment want to buy. Bring it down towards London and you know probably the best of the best remains the Bond Street shop. They're always lettable, the rents continue to rise and there's a steady stream of international luxury brands who demand a store on the world's prime pitches. The big question is around the shopping centre market, really, which is where we've seen some of the most significant yield rises or price falls. And they're really being challenged by CVAs, retailer failures, and particularly the great unanswered question of what you do with a big vacant department store. You touched on something then, which we just picked up before, but taking a step back, you said that we could be on the cusp of a really opportunistic market for seeing some good value or, or good deals even for investing in a retail asset uh, because the prices have come down which means the yield's gone up because essentially you're getting the same return but for less of the capital investment initially but as we've seen in the newspapers recently with Philip Green and his group a lot of retailers now struggling in the market big or small and be it right or wrong are making use of CVAs voluntary winding up now traditionally those are supposed to be only for those parties that are really struggling and would genuinely fold if it weren't for the ability to reduce the rents. But isn't that a risk for opportunistic buyers looking for deals in the retail market? 
It, it's definitely a risk, but I think nobody's going into this market with their eyes closed. I'm increasingly hearing the argument that, well, if you can buy the asset for 20, 30 percent off, then you can drop the rents enough on your vacant units to let them. And I think, you know, the question is perhaps not, is there enough retail demand? It's just have landlords perhaps got too greedy on rent in the past? And, and I think, you know, most people in the sector would admit that most UK retail is over-rented. So the strategy of these opportunistic investors is can we rebase rents to a level at which retailers can trade well? And then you've got a scheme that's full and, and, and you can actually put some rental growth in there. But, you know, yes, the, the question of retailer failures is, is a big one. And, it, you know, it is significant, but you have to remember that CVAs and administrations in the last three years, four years, have only affected just under 2% of all shops in the UK. And such has perhaps always been the case. Bad retailers have always failed. I think you're perhaps seeing, particularly with the department store market, the end of a segment that people really were questioning why it existed for the best part of the last 10 or 15 years. So retail has to adapt. And that throws open huge questions for landlords about should we adopt shorter leases? Should we have turnover rents? Things like that. You know, How do you make a retail asset work for the customer the owner and the shopper, I think it does have to be allowed to evolve more quickly. And, and our lease system perhaps has rather discouraged that in the past. Yeah, I think I think I agree with that. I think that's right. So I think overriding, there are opportunities out there. But as you said, unless you're not a sophisticated buyer, which why would you be going into that market anyway? You need to go in with your eyes open and take account of, of a risk of, of a CVA happening. Matt, we focused on retail there because that's been a hot topic recently. Another hot topic over the last couple of years in these uncertain times has been industrial. Industrial in the main, it seems, has plateaued out from the analysis done in the market. But for the multi-let industrial, it seems to have decreased in the yield potential. Why is that? Well, I think you're absolutely spot on, Paul. You know, logistics is probably the the yin to retail's yang. If you're deeply worried about people shopping online, then obviously you accept the fact we need more warehouses to store and distribute the stuff we're all buying online. And and globally, logistics has become very much the sector of choice because of that and because generally it offers quite long-term secure income streams, which are very popular with buyers. And indeed, in the UK, as we sort of cover in our latest Market Minutes report, industrial yields in the UK are below those of retail and offices for the first time ever. And then we're seeing a similar story in the US at the moment. And, and that's just a reflection of very, very strong buyer demand indeed. I think we're probably getting the close to the bottom of that, or a sort of the top of capital values, if you look at it that other way. There are definitely some signs, I think, that investors are saying maybe yields have gone as low as they should go on this sector, and are asking very sensible questions about the forward trajectory of rental growth, and is it enough to justify that price? But there's certainly no sign of a cessation of demand for these type of assets. And I think when you look beyond the UK, other mainland European markets who are just at the beginning of their online retail journey. You can see what, you know, country after country following the same track that Britain has with a steady rise in the proportion of retail sales that are online, which stimulates a steady increase in demand for industrial property. So I think perhaps some of that demand, investor demand, may well swing on to other countries to capture the boom. And, and one of our top picks, sort of pan-European at the moment, is definitely mainland European logistics. We've been looking at the investor market now, Matt, just turning to the occupational market, give us your elevator pitch for where the market's been over the last year. I think the occupational market is the area that surprised us most, to be honest, and it's the thing I probably most missed forecast, if that's not a, a double negative. You know, when the referendum hit, I think there was a very strong feeling that occupational risk was rising in the UK, particularly in the London office market. There was a perception that many bankers and professional service providers would, would flee into the Eurozone to escape from this. However, what we've seen over the last two years in the London office market, for example, is, is one of the best two-year periods ever for leasing of office space. And indeed, the first quarter of 2019 in the West End was the strongest first quarter 
for take up of office space that we've seen for six years. And this feels completely counterintuitive. You read every day about business confidence being weak, business investment being low. And I think what we're seeing here is the difference between those who need to do deals and those who don't need to do deals. Investors don't need to do deals generally. You know, they will wait for the right moment to buy. And most investors are not being forced to sell. But if you're the CEO of a big corporate or a professional services company based in London, and you are growing in terms of headcount, you can't just say, look, sorry, guys, you're going to have to sit in each other's laps. You've got to take more office space. And we're seeing very strong continuing demand from the sort of tech and media companies who account for about a quarter of the market. But also the financial services companies are really starting to grow. And it's very difficult to explain, but clearly businesses based in the UK sort of office sector are actually not doing too badly. Uh, they're also responding to the fact that there is a real shortage of office space in London and indeed in the big regional cities. So they're sort of planning further ahead. They're acquiring space that maybe they won't need for another three or four years. So occupational demand story in offices and logistics is very strong indeed. And we've, we've already touched on the retail story, which is obviously less strong. But it is a big surprise and it is slightly counterintuitive but you know it is for the investors looking at the market it's, it's quite comforting because without a tenant you have nothing yes that's, that's right and something you commented on before we started recording was that it's a needs market and what essentially you're saying there is if there's a absolute need to expand to increase space then you're going to go into the market you're going to look for additional space and so that that market in itself for occupiers wanting additional space isn't going to go away because companies are still growing despite what what the news says about Brexit ruining everyone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Matt, looking ahead, I know this isn't your favourite part of our podcast, reading the tea leaves. Say we were to crash out of Brexit with no deal. What, if any, impact do you think that might have on the UK real estate market, commercial real estate market, I don't think it would be fabulous. I think that would not be a likely scenario. I, you know, our view is that we would probably see a very similar story to what we saw immediately after the referendum, which was a, a brief, hard shock to confidence. And I think there would be some distressed selling or indeed some, some willing selling, you know, some people just looking to get out of the UK. And that would result in some price falls. I suspect it would be relatively short-lived because I would imagine the pound would also weaken quite sharply in that situation, which if, if the sort of Q3 and Q4 of 2016 tells us anything, that usually causes a rush of opportunistic cash investors in. You know, Back then it was mainly from Asia Pacific who just say, well, suddenly everything in the UK is 20% cheaper because of the currency plus whatever's happened to pricing, and, uh, and they send to deal. I think medium term it, you know it has more worrying signs for the sort of occupational market because commercial property just tracks uk gdp and if there ever is such a thing as a consensus amongst economists there appears to be a reasonable consensus that a hard or disorderly brexit would result in lower gdp growth or indeed a brief recession and i think you know that again would affect the occupational markets focusing on the occupational markets there you said that the gdp going down i mean to my mind, with clients, be they businesses or, or investors who, who, do, who do occupy space, I can't see the immediate impact because generally, particularly in the city, but also in the regions, that you have people on fixed long-term leases, which they can't get out of necessarily for a few years. So the impact, not necessarily immediate, but you're looking sort of medium to long term, really. Is that right? Yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on. I think the impact on the investment market will be relatively instantaneous sure. because that is very confidence led pricing. The impact on the occupational market would obviously follow the lease expiry, lease event structure. You would see perhaps companies who were planning on expanding not doing so. You may even see, probably see some business failures in some segments if it was a particularly bad downturn. So, yeah, I think, I think the occupational impact would be slower and over a more sustained period, but which would be absolutely typical of any period of lower than normal GDP growth in the UK. I have to say, however, I don't think the disorderly Brexit is, is the most likely scenario, but maybe I'm an eternally hopeful person. I think I am as well. Matt, just lastly, we've talked about the different areas of the commercial market, so your retail, your investment, your occupational, your offices. Is there anyone 
which you think will be impacted negatively or positively from just leaving in general? Oh, good question. I don't think I've really evolved any firm view of anyone who's going to benefit from it. That's interesting in itself. So, you said that you don't see there really being an upside to investors, occupiers, or any particular section of the market from leaving full stop. No, I think the, there will definitely be prices will move in favour of the buyer if the buyer can get themselves comfortable with what does the UK economy and business sector look like outside the EU. So, you know, some people will undoubtedly make some significant profits by buying at the bottom of a sort of confidence cycle. But in terms of the UK occupational market, which ultimately depends on businessmen and business women feeling confident or otherwise, um, there are going to, you know, there are parts of the country that are much less dependent on exports to the EU, and there are parts of the country that are very dependent. Many British businesses don't export at all, so arguably it would have limited impact on them. So I don't think that our worst case scenarios are not for a cataclysmic sort of post GFC or early 1990s style downturn in the market, but they are obviously worse than our core scenario, which is a relatively elegant move into the transition period at some unspecified point in the future. It's nice to finish on a relatively positive note. Well, I'm going to take some positive from it. It's not going to be cataclysmic as it was in, in the early 1990s. Matt, it's been a pleasure as always. I found it fascinating. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. You've been listening to Matt Oakley, Head of Commercial Research at Savills, and Paul Olaf, Legal Director, Real Estate at Ashford Solicitors. If you have any comments or questions about this podcast, then please drop me an email at p.olaf at ashfords.co.uk or leave a comment in the box below. Thanks for listening.